Valley, we thank you so much for being here. Holy Spirit, you know what? We know you're here. So we just ask you just to unveil our eyes, our hearts, our minds to see our Jesus today. Put him at the center. We know he's at the center of everything. Allow us to see him at the center of everything. Allow us to be changed. Let us be better people going out than what we were coming in today. And Holy Spirit, you know what? Have your way with me, man. Talk freely and truly and for me. And let's, let's bring this. Let's see our Jesus. Let's be changed. Let's be a better church going out today than we were coming in. And we thank you so much for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, we're going to talk about true worship. Hallelujah. Woo! Everybody says, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. My question is, what is worship? Truly, what is it? We like to throw that word around a lot, don't we? But do we actually know what it really means for us, right? Because I can tell you, I spent 26 years not in the church. I'm 32, yes. Six years saved. Woohoo! Since like six million years. But 26 years of my life not in church. And so when I got saved, got into the church, the word worship kept on coming up, right? And I can tell you, there's been all kinds of stuff. You see all kinds of stuff. So people never really, I would ask the question, what is it? And they never really give me a thing, right? They say there's always an outward thing that comes out of you. So when I was told that, I started looking around, looking at people and services, right? You see people throw their hands really high. So you start to be like, oh, that must be, they must worship. So I throw my hands really high, right? Or they put their hands halfway. So you put your hands halfway, or you put one hand up, right? And or you sing louder, or you don't sing at all, right? And I started to play these little games. I saw all these people, until I saw somebody go crazy on the piano, and I was like, "Is that worship?" And I'm talking about they ran, they got crazy with it, and they ran around circles around the piano, the keyboard, and I was like, "Holy cow, is this worship? You know, is this worship?" And everything. So I looked at it and I was wondering by that. What truly is worship? Are we just playing the church games or are we actually worshiping, right? Is, is that the case? And so and so we so we look at that. And so my question to you today, what is worship? And so we're going to take a look at that and find out what it really truly means because it actually affects our lives. You may not be aware that you may be already worshiping, right? And that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to have a little fun journey because we have a little something. And we're actually going to have it demonstrated today. Right? I think that's one of the biggest things, right? So we're going to play with this, right? So we've been talking about the tabernacle for a, for a million years, have we not? I think so. We've been sitting here talking about it since January 1, right? So we're going to keep going at it. So we talked about the alignment last week, the last couple of weeks, but today we're going to talk about the outer walls, right? If I can get my clicker right. I turn it on. There we go. So we're going to talk about the outer walls. So in Exodus, 20, Exodus 27, it starts talking about how to build the walls, right? So we're going to look at that because this starts to be kind of cool. You start to see why these walls were built and why they were there because that comes important. So in Exodus 27, verse 9, it says, And you shall make the court of the tabernacle, or it's called, or called the outer court. On the south side, the court shall have hangings of fine twine linen, right? So the, the whole thing's going to be surrounded by fine twine linen, right? Sounds like they're getting a little twang up in these jokers, I'm telling you. We did not know if they spoke southern. In the Bible, we now we do know. And I'm actually going to show you something else that they have there. They actually kind of go a little more southern than we think. But it's just like you and I, right? Who says the Bible's not relevant, people, right? All right, so find us one linen. And we know linen in the Bible represents God's righteousness, right? And he says, a hundred cubits long for one side. Their pillars shall be twenty and their sockets twenty of bronze. But the hooks of the pillars and their joints shall be of silver, which I find to be quite interesting. If you notice one thing, you're going to see that bronze was always outside the tabernacle. Within the tabernacle was what? Gold. Gold represents God's divinely, his righteousness, right? As well. But bronze spoke of judgment. Do you remember also, too, when we talk about the walls? How they were always placed on sockets. In this case, they had, they had the sockets there. They were sockets of silver. The wall sat on will represent Silver meant redemption. But if you notice here that the sockets here, the poles are set on bronze, placed on judgment. Now there's some silver doing here. I'm going to talk about that because we're going to talk about that. It's going to be kind of cool of it to see. But it says, likewise for the north side hanging at 100 cubits and there are 20 pillars and there are 20 sockets of bronze. And if you didn't know, 20 means redemption as well. But the hooks of the pillars and their joints shall be silver. So here's a nice picture, right? 
Thank God somebody else created it. We didn't have to go, go through and create it. But this is what it kind of looked like, right? So you think about it. These things are about over seven feet tall. Your average person is not seven feet. It's very rare be to see somebody above seven feet or seven feet or taller, right? But these are seven, seven plus feet tall. They had poles there and they had the land stretched between. Now they had the, the, the silver wires pegged down to the ground, right? We know that keeps it what? Strength up, keeps it stability from the winds blowing and everything. <coughs> But you notice that the, the linens are hooked onto each one with silver, right? Now think about this. The wall completely surrounded, except for one part, we'll talk about that too, surrounded the tabernacle, which means what? You can't just walk to the tabernacle, can you? There's a barrier between you and the tabernacle, right? We're going to talk about that. What does, this rep, what does this mean for them, right? What does it really mean? It means they were separated. That you can't just come over the wall anytime you wanted to. There was a separation from God's righteousness, His holiness. You were separated, right? We're going to talk about that. <laughs> we're talking about true worship here, but stay with me. We're going to see it in action. That's the part, right? You want to see it in action? You want to know what true worship is? to see it in action. So you couldn't get across, right? So there has to be a way between you and God, right? He's actually starting to spell it out here with the walls himself. But we're going to talk about. It. So let's keep going. It says, In the breadth of the core of the west side, there shall be hangings of 50 cubits, and then 10 pillars and 10 sockets. In the breadth of the core of the front, the east side shall be 50 cubits. The hangings for one side of the gate shall be 15 cubits, and then three pillars and three sockets. On the other side, the hangings shall be 15. The cubits were three pillars. This probably means nothing to you guys until you actually see it. So let's look at it. So you have this is space in the east, this is west, north. South. And they did this every time. So you know what? They had judged it by the sun, right? How to line themselves. So this wall was smaller, wide, wide, smaller, wide in length, and than this one because it's a rectangle. You understand? Cool. So they had a hundred here and they only had fifty poles here. So it kind of gives you an idea how big it was. Right? So they separate, and there's only one entrance, we'll talk about the entrance way. But this is gonna be fun. Now check this out. When you kind of drop down a little bit more, and we're going to talk about those pegs or the silver line, right? In verse 19, it says, All the tabernacle of utensils and instruments used in all service, and all its pegs and all the pegs of the court shall be bronze, right? So they had a silver line, the silver wire connected to the poles, and the pegs or the nails which drove into the ground were bronze, which creates stability, right? You have winds, there's winds, you don't want it to blow away. That's why, hence why it and and then you peg it down, right? So it doesn't blow away. Stability, strength. This word pegs is mentioned somewhere else, though. You want to see how God's starting to tell a story here. Everything speaks of someone, right? One person in particular. So check this out. The word peg there in Hebrew is only mentioned one other place. This particular word peg. So let's check it out. Isaiah 22. It's funny how the guy kind of puts himself together. He puts a little rabbit trail, right? You kind of go down the rabbit hole. And it's fun when you go down, right? So in verse 20 and, and 22, it says, in, in that day I will call my servant Elikim, son of Hedekiah, Hedekiah, I will clothe him with your robe. So I, this is, a, is a, a messianic prophecy of who? Jesus, right? He's talking about raising up his son. Now notice he says, I will clothe him with your robe, not with his own. So it means what? He becomes like you and I. Our robe is what? Filthy rags. He's talking about a robe. Hence why we have the um, prayer shawl, which speaks of what? Righteousness. It's a robe. It's called a robe of righteousness. Our righteousness is filthy rags. His is pure and clean. He's saying, my son is going to wear your robe. Now check this out. And we'll bind your girl on him. Servant. He's serving. Right? And we'll commit your authority to his hand. And he shall be a father in the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David I will lay upon his hand, his shoulder. And he shall open and no one shall shut. He shall shut and no one shall be shall open. And I will fasten him like a peg. That's why we hear it again. Nail or nail in a firm place. He was nailed to the cross, wasn't he? Jesus was nailed to the cross. And he will come a throne of honor and glory. 
to his father's house. I love it, right? We all think we're talking about just talking about a king here, a Jerusalem, a king in Jerusalem. But Isaiah's actually talking about Jesus. Now, check this out. It's talking about nails. So we know what? When those poles of firm foundation to get them strength and protection, they were nailed down. I love that. So he was what? When the Israelites were walking across the walls, it's actually speaking of, hey, you can't come in, but there'll be a time you can. He's already speaking redemption to them. He's already speaking about his son. Notice that, that and I'll show you, that there was a gate, and it was on the east end. Notice that if you were in the earth tribe, you had to walk around the wall to get there. And we'll talk about that more. All right? Keeps going. I love this part. He says, and they would hang on him the island of the whole weight or responsible for his father's house. Was it responsible for the father's house? The offspring the issue of the family high and low. Every small vessel from the cups, even to all the flies and the built. Big bulging bottles. What are you saying? What did you say? The cup I shall drink. You can't drink, right? John, John, James said, I'll, I'll drink that cup. But Jesus is the only one who can bear it, right? What do, you th- what do you think he's talking about? Sin. All of our sins. What we deem to be high and what we deem to be small. All covered, right? And that day, says Lord host, the nail or peg that was fastened to the sure place shall give away and be moved and hewn down and fall, and the burden that was upon it all shall be cut off. So the burden of sin, done. You don't have to worry about it anymore. It's talking about prophecy here, right? And guess what? The walls nailed down speaks to the same thing. Because it's the only time that the word nail or peg is mentioned. That Hebrew word is mentioned. Right? So let's go back. <laughs> in Genesis 22, we talk about worship here, right? So let's get to this. We know the walls, so there's something to do with the walls. You can't get in. So you want to see worship in action. So let's show what it means. The first mention of worship is actually mentioned in Genesis 22. It actually has something mentioned that comes before it, which is something that's interesting too. So we have Mr. Um, was it um, Abraham, right? Mr. Abraham finally had a son, Isaac. When Isaac came weaned, he kicked out Ishmael, right? It was just him. And at that moment, Isaac's missing again is missing here in 22, right? This is a very beautiful scripture here. If you don't know, this is a beautiful picture of what Jesus and the Father, the Son and the Father did going to the cross, right? In essence, right? So, in Genesis 22, verse 22, God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son. Let's be real, Abraham had two sons. But he says he doesn't see the first, he only sees Isaac, which was birthed from him. So, you guess what? God doesn't see your own effort, your failures, your effort. He sees the fruit of which he brings out through you, right? Your only son, whom you love. This word love is mentioned for the very first time ever. Ever in scripture. It's first mentioned. And go to the region of Moriah and offer him there a burnt offering upon one of the mountains of which I will tell you. What does it sound like to you? John 3.16. And I and my <laughs> for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He's asking Isaac to do the same thing. This is why this is a perfect picture of what Jesus did going to the cross, right? So Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, two servants, none named, his son Isaac, and he split the wood for the burnt offering, and then he began to trip to the place over which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance, Mount Moriah, where the temple mount was built, the God's temple, right? Which isn't the highest peak in Jerusalem, the highest peak is Calvary. All right? Verse 5, Abraham said to his servants, settle down, stay here with the donkey. And, and I, a young man, will go a yonder. That's why I said this now and get really southern, going. Go a yonder. And worship. And come again to you. The word worship. Notice that he says, I will come back. And we. And come to you again. See, he's already saying, God has a greater sacrifice than my son, Isaac. So, because that God loves us, he's going to provide. What happened? The father, son... He put the firewood on back of Isaac, and the father and son walked up the hill. What does that speak of? Jesus walking up the cross with the cross on his back. And the father was with him the whole time. 
The father never left the son. It's only that at the cross he turned his back. He was still there. He just turned his back again. So it speaks of judgment upon the son, right? For you and I. So the judgment being on us, he put it on his son, right? It's interesting. Abraham said, we're going to get stay sacrifice my son. I know, God, you're going to sacrifice something greater. And it's not going to come from my effort, but it's going to be by your effort. And they went up to the mount and they worshiped. Did not, did not God provide a sacrifice? Did not? Abraham turned around and there was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns or in the thorn bush by the horns. Speaks of a mature ram. You want to know what really happened? Did John say, uh, in the Gospel of John, Jesus said, he goes, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. When Abraham turned around, he saw the Son of God. Because what, what was there behind Mount Moriah? Mount Calvary. He saw the ram caught in the thicket. Jesus on the cross. That's why he rejoiced. He worshipped out. And what we're seeing here is worship is a response to God's sacrificial love for you and I. Now check this out. <coughs> God called it worship. You can see it in Hebrews 9. <laughs> it's not revealed in the old, but it's revealed in the new. The old is the, old is the New Testament hidden. And the, old te and the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed, right? Well, thanks. In Hebrews 9, God calls it worship when the Israelites brought a sacrifice into the tabernacle, to the tabernacle out of courts. He called that worship. And what the, the priests did when they Put the <laughs> cut the part of the animal, cut the part of the animal, and put it in. He called that worship too, right? He says the worshippers. So check this one out. The word worship in Hebrew is shaka, ah, shaka, shaka. I even put it there. And I still my stuff. Oh Jesus, I need you, Jesus. All right. To bow oneself down, to sink down, and to be depressed, right? To be depressed. Right? So it means to make yourself low. What does that sound like? Humble. Humble is to make yourself low. I'm going to show you something. We think that it means us singing out is worship. But what worship really means to look to God greater than yourself. That means what? We think it still sounds so easy. It means renewing your mind. When you trade in your high thoughts for his thoughts. When you stop trying to do something in your own effort and you allow him to work through you, that's worship. And we're like, well, if we sing, what comes out is praise or thanksgiving. Right? So let's, let's go. Ready? Let's see it. <coughs> go back to Exodus 7, 27. It says in verse 16, he says, For the gate of the court there shall be a hanging for a screen, 20 cubits long, of blue, purple, scarlet, and fine twine linen and boil. It shall have four pillars and four sockets for them. And all the pillars <laughs> around about the court shall be joined together with the silver rods, and their hooks shall be silver. The length of the court shall be 100 cubits, and the breadth 50 in height. So he's talking about the length, right? You want to see what it looked like? Now, we didn't get it right here when I had a picture. It's, I couldn't find a picture that actually had it right. It's embroiled, right? There's something that's actually embroiled on the front part of it, and you probably know too. But there's no share bins on this one. The share bins are only found on the tabernacle. But their faces are. What? Oh, poor little more. What it looked like is very similar to this. But with the four faces of the gospel. Remember the four faces that we talked about? The man, the eagle, the, the ox, and the, oh my gosh, the ox, the eagle, the lion. Right? The four faces of the gospel were there. Now, notice that there was no gate in this sense. We think of gate means there's a door that opens for us to walk through, right? That's our human, modern United States society, right? What he was doing is kind of very similar. You had to pick it up and bow yourself under to come in. Now, you could not go in unless you had sacrifice. So what were you admitting to God? You were saying, one, I was a sinner, and I need a Savior. And you bowed yourself down to walk in. 
Worship means to bow yourself down. So this is why God called this worship. You bow. Saying, I'm weak, but you're strong. You know one of the most famous scriptures in the Bible that says about worship is? 2 Corinthians 12, and Paul says, For when I am weak, he is strong. So the most powerful worship mind. He was renewing his mind, saying, I'm weak, but God, you're strong. He started looking to God being strong. You know what's so funny is when we look to him and it's our own efforts, we're actually placing him first, aren't we? We're not looking at our own selves to get it done. We're looking to him to get it done through us. That's good works. Otherwise, it's a dead work. It'll come to nothing at the end. But the good works always stand, right? <clears throat> Hence why when Jesus said this, the woman said to him, Sir, I see you understand that you are a prophet. Remember John 4? He talking about the, Samaritan, the woman Samaritan. Jesus starts missing worship for the, one of the first times that really in the Bible, in the Gospels, in the four Gospels, he talks about it here. Right? If you didn't know, this is, this is a very beautiful scripture. We had a whole sermon on We did this whole study here, which is actually beautiful. But she, she's running about. We wonder why Jesus started pointing out some of her faults to her. But he really wasn't. In the sense that we do, we like to point out people's faults. Hey, you gotta repent! But in a sense, he was trying to show that he still loves her, in spite of herself. Right? So she tried to flip the table. We saw, saw that she tried to flip the table a couple times, and she flipped it here, right? So she says, I see the prophet. Our forefathers worship on this mountain in Samaria, right? But you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place where it is necessary the prophet to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father merely in this mountain, nor in Jerusalem. People are like, what in the world is he talking about? Well, it means what? This thing about this. The Israelites could only come in every time. They had to, I love this part. They came in, placed their hands on the sacrifice, slipped the throat of the animal. I know we're getting a little graphic here. But they slipped the throat of the animal. They transferred their sin into the animal. The animal uh, transferred its righteousness or its pureness into the man. And, it's, and then the man slit his throat. He became a sacrificial sacrifice, right? Then the man walked out and left the tabernacle area. Notice that he had to keep bringing the lamb to keep coming in, and they had to walk back out. Coming in, walk back out. That sounds like a lot of work, you know what? Jesus said, there's a time coming that that is going to end. I got to get you to be in the court forever. Right? You Samaritans do not know what you're worshiping. You worship what you do not comprehend. You don't understand this. We do know what we are worshiping. We worship that what we have knowledge of and understand. For all, after all, salvation comes from among the Jews or in the midst of Jews. What is he talking about? Himself. Actually, if you didn't know, Jesus' name means salvation. He's talking about worshiping him, being their sacrifice, their wholeness. Their relief from all sin, their relief from sickness and disease, sick, relief from poverty, relief, re, relief from just having a sound mind or a plague mind, right? To a sound mind. He's saying, you're going to worship me. Hence why he says, a time will come, however, indeed, it's already here. Why? Because Jesus is standing there. He's out here. Look to me. That's worship. When the true gentleman is already here, when the true worshipers will worship and trust him, when they look at him. So funny. It is that simple. When you stop looking at yourself, or you could be looking around at other stuff, in the sense you're thinking that this is going to make it happen. This is going to make it Instead of looking at him. And when you turn to him, that's worship. And we're like, well, what comes out of your mouth is worship. It's praise. It's thanksgiving. Hence why when we, when we call it praise and worship before service, right? When we get into it, it could be empty praise. But as soon as you look at him and see him, that's worship. You're turning to him. You're seeing him in his beauty, his splendor, his dollar and, and you and praise is then generate out of you comes out or you enter his gates with thanksgiving.
praise his way thanksgiving, isn't it? The true worshipers will worship this Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such, just such people as these, as his worshipers. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Finally, Jesus is grace and truth. He is spirit. Is not he, he, we're in him. It's funny when we start to realize that that's what worship. That's true worship. Some of the change your reality, when you change your mind, when you start to look to him instead of look to yourself or look into the bank to make sure you get your loan, right? Oh, they like me because look at my credit. Your credit ain't going to get you nowhere. It's not. It's God who gets it. He may help you raise your credit, but it still be him who gets it. Because they can still turn you down. I've seen people get turned down with 800 credit scores. I believe I have. Had no debt and get turned down. It's funny. It's him who does it. And when you look to him, that's worship. You're making him greater than anything in your, in your life. Now, let's just do that. So, we know the walls, right? They represent his holiness and righteousness, separating you from all of that, right? His righteousness and his holiness kept you out. Because it was what? Against you. Right? When Adam fell, God's holiness and righteousness was against us. But because of Jesus made restoration to his righteousness holiness. Now his holiness and righteousness is on our side when we enter the gate. Did you know when you accepted Jesus, when you believe in Jesus, you worship God. You stepped in. What's so great? You never came back out. You're still in. Because First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.30, I love this scripture. He's, but it is from him that you have life in Christ Jesus, whom God made, who he made, Jesus, our wisdom from God, revealed to us knowledge of the divine plan of salvation, and previously hidden manifested as itself as he was made our righteousness in our consecration or holiness in our redemption. So many of us think that, you want to watch worship happen? So many of us think of us, we're going into the gate, through the gate, and then we're going back out. I got to get back into his holiness when the real realization, you're in his holiness. Are you in Christ Jesus? Yes. Then you are holy. You're in his holiness and in his righteousness. When you change your mind today, you are worshiping. It's worship. You understand that you're still in the courts. You're not outside the courts looking there. You're already in there. As a matter of fact, we talk about that. We are what? The walls of the tabernacle. We're the walls of the tabernacle. We're not outside looking in. We're inside now. Now, I found this to be interesting too. Notice that the, the walls protect us, kept us from coming in. Right? You're in here now. Guess what? His righteousness and holiness was against you. Now that you're in him, his holy and righteousness are for you. So you're in here now. His holy and his righteousness are protecting you. They were once against you. Now they are protecting you. Right, anybody else give them to you? That means what? The devil can't touch you. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Renew your mind today. Guess what? You'll be worshiping God in the truth and in spirit, right? Because you're realizing what Jesus has done. You're looking to what he did and not what you can do or what you have done, but what he has done. And it's so beautiful to look at that, understand that. Because that's true. I told you we're going to demonstrate. And if you change your mind to it, you are demonstrating worship. And then your heart may be burning, and you want to say, thank you, Jesus. That's praise. Praise is a response to worship. You're worshiping because of what? His love for you. You're looking to it, and you're changing your mind to it. 
you accept it. And this happens every day. Even, even if you already exchanged it, change your mind, but you're still thinking about it. Man, God, look at you, man. You saved me from that. Look, man, I'm working. Your, your grace is amazing, man. Look what you're doing in my life here. You are still worshiping. Because you're still looking at him to be strong, even in that area. So, if we don't always worship in every area, do we? It's okay. It's okay. God is giving us there, isn't he? And with, through one of us, we keep pointing each other back in those areas to him. That's funny. We help each other worship, don't we? When Korea's up here and she's singing, she's focusing not, she's not singing to y'all, she's singing to who? Him. And she's focused on him. And she's helping each one of us to turn from ourselves, from our cares, and to look up to him. Amen. And worship. That's worship. And then the praise comes out. Right? Now, we notice this too. Ah. <sighs> I was actually driving to the shop a couple of days ago when it hit me. I'll, I'll leave it here. Where it says Levites, that's for the tabernacle. They, 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 they can't the round the tabernacle, right? The priest did, the Levites. Noah's, the gate is here, east, point east. I love this. To order to go in, you had to go from east to west. We talked about this a couple months ago, didn't we, um, Tim? Oh, I love it. He has removed my transgression as far as the east is from the west. So when you, when you came in, you actually demonstrated what Jesus has done. It's funny how they, they were actually showing what he did. That hence why the psalm said, from east to west. It's talking about entering into the tabernacle funny how he said that. And that is worship. It's all about sin being removed. Seeing him. Because you know what? We, we got troubles with it. You got troubles today? That's all kinds of stuff, right? Are you looking at the circumstances? Are you looking at yourself to get you out? If you look to him and start relying on him, that's what worship is. It's worshiping. It's amazing, isn't it? And God has loved that. That's spirit and truth. You can do that anywhere. Because guess where you at? You're in the tabernacle. You don't have to keep going back and forth to gates. You're already in. You already bowed your knee, per se. You're going to say, every knee shall bow? Well, guess what? Some people already bowed their knee. Huh? Didn't we? It's the name of Jesus. Didn't we do that? We did it. We went underneath the covering. We speaks of his finished work. He had the blue, which speaks of grace. The purpose speaks of royalty. The, blue, the scarlet speaks of his bloodshed. You came under it. He says that's worship. To humble oneself. It's all good, isn't it? And then Jesus said, I'm the door, or I'm the gate in Greek. He says, I'm the, I'm the gate. What was he talking about? He was talking about the tabernacle. And the Jews would have saw this because they knew about it. Hence why John is richly mentioned to them about what? Revealing that he is God to them. And the Jews were there listening, and he says, I'm the door or I'm the gate. And they would be like, What? You're God? Because there's only one way in. He says, Yep, I'm it. You know what? You know, if you understand that portion, it means that you're already in the gate. You understand he's the gate. It means you have already passed through. You're the sheepfold. You're in the fold. You're good. And we understand that. We are God. And we start to worship him when we understand that. It's amazing how it comes out and how it happens. It's not, woo! Oh, you run around the, the sanctuary. I've seen that too. I've seen some crazy stuff. I've seen people just dance in place. They did the little dance and they stopped. And they went back to it again. I was like, what are we doing, people? We look weird. Let's be real. We look weird. And if somebody came out of the streets, they came in, they'd be like, what is wrong with these people? I'm going back into the streets. At least I know what's there. Right? What makes it should make us crazy is just Jesus, right? 
and it's what he has done for us, and we don't do stuff out of our own effort, but out of his effort, that's what makes us different. That's what makes us, we are pure, peculiar. So, yeah, you might sing, you might lift up your hands, but it's praise out of turning to him or worship. I want, us to be, I want us to be a church that worships Him in spirit and truth. I want us every day to turn to Him because He's greater. And what He, is, what he has done is greater than what we could ever, have ever done or could ever do. And we start to rely on Him and that is worship. Throwing yourself on Him. Carry me, God. You can do better than I, God. You can get the job done, God. You're so much better than me, God. And allow him to deliver us. Allow him to bring the manifestation out. Does that mean we sit back and just chill? No. It means we may walk. We may do stuff. We may do stuff. Well, it's not us, but it's the grace of God. It's God working through us, working our salvation out. Because he gives us the will and desire. He first gives us the will or the desire. We say yes, and he gives us the power, which comes out, which means what? At the end, we can't say it was us, but it was by the grace of God that did it. And we can sit back and say it was him. And we are worshiping. Amazing, isn't it? How simple God is. It takes man to screw it all up, don't <laughs> it? really does. We screw it all up. It, we really do. We make it complicated. When reality is simple. For God doesn't want any man to perish. Why do he make it so simple? One place. So let's pray, church. Father, I thank you so much that you love us, man. Jesus, we thank you so much that you were willing and you did it, man. You did it. You gave yourself up for us. We thank you so much for that. We thank you that you are our God, that you that you love us, that you came down to be like us. I pray that we get a fresh revelation of the Holy Spirit bring it out in us every day about what he has done for us, that we may turn from ourselves and turn to you and worship. And that we may be a church that shows what you have done for us, Jesus, not what we are doing, but what you have done, and how great and mighty powerful you are, and how your fruit bears through us, but it's not us, but it's you. And we just thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.